and joining us. I didn't want my periscope to cut off <laughs> like it always does in the middle of me talking, so I just decided to do a part two. And we are back with Tools of Titans. Again, this is uh, a segment I believe is going to be an encouragement for those of you who are writers. He says some very good things today, um, and I hope that you will tune in and that you will take note of what is being said. Today's Titan is James L. Tucher. James L. Tucher. And um, he is an American hedge fund manager. He's an entrepreneur and a best selling author. He has founded or co founded more than 20 companies, including Reset and Stock Picker. 13 of his companies failed, and three of them made him tens of millions of dollars. He is the author of 17 books, including The Power of No. I've never seen anyone build a large, committed readership faster than James. So, uh, the first uh, question and the first quote that James puts out into this uh, setting today is this. He says, we all have, let's say, two or three dozen massive pain points in our lives that everyone can relate to. I try to basically write about those and then I try to write about how I attempted to recover from them. And so he says um, one of the things that makes James, this particular guy, one of the things that makes him so successful in writing is the fact that he does not ignore his pains and fears but he actually explores them and he shows the light at the end of the tunnel without ignoring the darkness in the middle. This is refreshing in a world of rah-rah, positive thinking gurus who are all for smiles and high fives. Some of the most popular writings have been the least time consuming but the most uncomfortable. To produce these, I usually ask myself, what am I embarrassed to be struggling with and what am I doing about it? So one of the things that I completely agree with uh, when James uh, says this, is facing your embarrassments and your struggles. If you are a writer, <laughs> you may not put all of your embarrassments and your struggles out for the public eye, right? Or you might not put them all in your writing, but it does help to journal your embarrassments and your struggles. Um, I know that the premise of one of my most popular book series up there came out of an embarrassment for my own self. I just turned it into um, a fictional premise. And that was, what if you believe that God has told you that someone is to be your spouse and you really believe that God told you that, but it turned out to be untrue or it turned out to not be that person? Are you going to throw yourself a pity party? Are you going to um, decide that you're never going to trust that you heard the voice of God again? Are you going to stop right there and let that be the end of your love life because the person that you thought that you were supposed to marry, you didn't marry? Or are you going to open up and let God really take control over your love life and really show you who he has ordained for your life, which is what God did for me. So that premise, I put it into a fiction form and I gave that character some of my character traits and I gave her a community and it turned into a wonderful series that is now helping people in their love life, in their relationships, um, learning principles of, of courtship, learning what it means to uh, woo someone, learning what it means to be in community, learning what it means to uh, lose a relationship, and learning what it means to have God guide you through relationship. It's all in fiction form now, but it has some very real principles. And so now I have pastors in churches that actually utilize my books for marriage counseling right like I have them utilizing it for engagement counseling to help people understand are you even really ready for marriage right 
I have people that are using it for courtship to understand what is that process? What does it mean? What does courtship look like? What does it mean to woo a woman? And all of that came out of me facing an embarrassment and writing about it. So I think that is an excellent point, you know, that he's, tell he's telling you that some of the best writers don't hide their embarrassments but they take their embarrassments and their struggles and they begin to find find the purpose of that thing and they begin to use it in their writing his second point is if you can't generate 10 ideas generate 20. james recommends the habit of writing down 10 ideas each morning in a writer's pad or a tiny notebook this exercise is for developing your idea muscle and confidence for creativity on demand so regular practice is more important than the topics so you ask yourself well what if I just can't come up with 10 ideas okay so if you can't come up with 10 ideas come up with 20 <laughs> and I know you're like what come up with 20 what he's saying is they don't have to all be good ideas but you need to be able to get your mind thinking get your brain activated and he says don't put too much pressure on yourself because perfectionism is the enemy of your idea muscle some people will sit and they'll think for long periods of time trying to come up with one idea rather than just getting ideas out they don't have to be your best ideas they don't have to make sense at the time you can go back and review and evaluate what you've written down and you can say, hmm, that's crazy. Um, that's not going to work. But at least you are exercising, as he said, your idea muscle. You're getting your thoughts out. And it is okay to come up with bad ideas. And then he says, once you, you know, have your ideas written down, let's see. What I want to grab. So, I don't do necessarily um, a journal. Sometimes I do sticky notes, right? So, here's just a blank page of sticky notes. And sometimes I, I might write a quote or I might write a thought that comes to mind. Like I have one stuck on my refrigerator today <laughs> of uh, uh, affirmation that I want to get up and say in the morning time. And I'll put it on a sticky tab. But what he's saying is after you get your 10 ideas, you know, if you're writing on a paper, even if you're writing on a sticky tab, you can divide it into two columns. And your first column is going to be your idea. Right. And then your second column is going to be first steps. And I just like stickers because. You know, I can plaster them wherever I need to plaster them. All right. So I've got my idea section and I've got my first steps. And he said, remember, only the first step. Because you can have an idea and you write down that first step and you never know where that first step can actually take you. Um, and so he gave the example of Richard Branson. And most people know who Richard Branson is if you're into business. Um, you know that he um, started an airline and he said Richard Branson had an idea to start an airline because of the poor service that he got on an airline flight. So his idea was start an airline and he was thinking about how can I start this airline from scratch with no money to actually just buy a plane and so his first step was to call an airline and see if they had an airplane that he could lease right so because he did that and he started with simply leasing a, a airplane that is what got him into the airline business even though he didn't have the money to buy a plane so that's an idea you know like me you don't necessarily have to use a journal but the point is to start writing your ideas down get to writing if you have been slowful in this area get to it <laughs> all right and don't give any excuses for yourself just don't i don't want to hear the excuses just get to writing your ideas down 
Um, I know one idea I know I probably could have made a couple million off of that I didn't write down. I told it to my husband years ago, and but I didn't write it down. And then I look up in a couple years and I actually see my idea being used in restaurants that were not thinking about it at the time. So I'm speaking from experience that when God gives you an idea, get it done, move to the first step as he said, and write it down. All right? So sample lists of daily 10 practice. Sample lists of daily 10 practice. These are some ideas of 10 things that can get you started. So if you're like, lady, you're telling me to do this, but I have no idea where to start. Here are a few different kinds of lists to get you jump started. All right, because I don't want anybody leaving this scope with an excuse. So beginning tomorrow, you can pick one of these and start writing ideas down under these lists of 10. All right. So here's one. Writing down 10 ridiculous things that you would invent. 10 ridiculous things that you would, would invent. Here's another one. 10 books that you can write. 10 books that you can write. Most of us can write 10 books. Mm -hmm. 10 books that you can write. Think about the experiences that you've had in your life and what 10 subject matters could you write on. For some of us, we probably got more than 10. <laughs> All right. Some of us could write a book on how to get over people who dislike you and keep moving with your life. That's a book. Because some people can't get over um, people disliking them. They get stuck in what people think about them. But if you know how to get past that, you can write a book on it. All right. Ten people that I can send ideas to. Ten people that I can send ideas to. Here's another one. Ten blogs or ten videos, short videos that I can shoot. They can be 30 second videos. They can be one minute videos. They can be three minute videos. But 10 videos that I can shoot. Different topics. Okay. Here's another one. 10 things I disagree with that everyone else assumes is right. 10 things that I disagree with that everyone else assumes is right. Here's another one. 10 ways to take old Facebook posts or even old writings of yours and make books out of them. 10 ways to take old posts or old writings and make books out of them. Here's another one. 10 people I want to be friends with by the end of 2017. And then think about what's the first step to contact those people. You can do all of them or you can do one. But what I'm get, what I'm doing is I'm jump starting and giving you some lists to think about. Because some people are like, well, I have no idea where to start my writing exercises at. So I'm just giving you some ideas. You can choose to do all of them or you can pick one and get started on that one. Ten things I can do differently today. What can I do differently today that I haven't been doing all along? Some of us, it's very simple. Drink more water. Eat more vegetables. Call my relatives that I haven't talked to since last year. So 10 things I can do differently today. Here's another one. 10 ways I can save time. This is a good one for people who are always late to everything. <laughs> You're always late or you're always procrastinating and then you're frustrated and then you're staying up to one, two o'clock in the morning. This is also a good one for people who are in college, who are still learning how to manage their time, how to, you know, they're, they're managing how to get up early, how to follow a schedule, how to follow a system, how to get to their classes on time, how to handle their extracurricular activities plus work. 
If you are a working mother, that's a good one for you. 10 things I 10 ways I can save time preparing my meals for the week. Okay? Here's another list. 10 things I learned from X. And X could be um, someone you've recently spoken to, spoken with, excuse me, someone you have recently read. Um, that's one that I do all the time is if I finish a book, I tend to, as you'll see with this one, <laughs> I've got lots of writing and lots of underlined things and notes. And when I get done reading a book, I go back through that book and I look up and I look at the things I have underlined and the things that I have taken note of that that person said and I will put it in my own journal of things I learned from reading that particular book. Here's another one. 10 things I'm interested in getting better at. 10 things I'm interested in getting better at. For some people, they need to put down their spelling and grammar. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, 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 that's a pet peeve of mine. Listen, and I put this on my I put this on my social media yesterday. If you're going to insult people or you're going to tell people off, please make sure your spelling and your grammar is on point because you at least want them to take you seriously. You know, I see so many posts, and, and of course this is a pet peeve for me because I'm an editor. I see so many posts that have brilliant thoughts. Brilliant! But there's so many grammatical and spelling errors in it that I have to stop reading it because I am frustrated. So it's hard for me to receive your message when everything else is off. <laughs> now I understand, I understand spell check has a demon in it, I get it. I understand that sometimes you can be typing in the right word and spell check will put in a completely different word. And actually that's that's actually a <laughs> that's actually an idea. Somebody needs to create an app called spell check the spell check. Because spell check is shady in and of itself. So you can be typing and spell check will slip in words that you didn't intend. I get that. But before you hit post or before you hit publish, can you at least go back and read what you wrote? And then you'll recognize that, oh my gosh, spell check just, just went in and started changing words, right? So that could be one of the things you might want to get better at. I want to get better at speaking, right? I want to get better at my writing skills so that people can understand what it is I'm trying to say. If you're saying this is a word of the Lord or if you're saying this is a prophecy from God and you wrote it out and there's like 50 mistakes in it, chances are people are not going to take you seriously. I just hate to be the one to break that to you, but that's the reality. Sometimes people are not going to take you seriously because they see all of the errors in what you're saying a perfect God said to you. And I promise I'm not trying to throw shade. But I see it so often that I'm just like, do they not have an editor? And it's not just everyday people. It's people who can afford an editor. <laughs> it's people who can afford to have somebody look at their writing and make sure it's on point. It's people who have page administrators. And if you have a page administrator, to me, you need also need to have a page editor. Like if you're sending, if you're sending posts to someone and you're paying them to post for you, then they ought to know how to edit. Okay? They need to know how to edit. So that's all I'm going to say on that. But 10 things you're interested in getting better. All right. And the last one, 10 things you were interested in as a kid that might be fun to explore now. Well, I know one of the things I was interested in as a kid, I, I really thought that I was uh, evil Knievelet Jr. And so I would get into all kinds of stuff. You know, I would be, I was the kid that, 
Um, most people would call the quote unquote tomboy. Like I would climb trees um, all the way up to the top and then fall and almost broke my back on some tree roots. Um, I was the kid that would be in the backyard with a couple of my friends and we'd be trying to create a bomb. Um, so I was a very uh, adventurous kid. We would make, um, what do you call those things? Ramps, right? We would get ramp, we would get wood, old wood, and we would make these ramps and then we would ride our bikes on them and try to do flips and pop willies and all that stuff. That was me. All right? So those were things I was interested in as a kid that might be fun to explore now. Only with, you know, a helmet and some knee pads <laughs> and a couple of other things, right? So think about some things that you might have been interested in in your childhood that might be fun to explore now. That's just another idea for a list. So the, the issue is, and the thing is, you can keep going on ways that you can start getting your writing and your thoughts and your ideas out. So all of those things that I've mentioned are different lists that you can start looking at and thinking about and writing down what your ideas are and seeing where they will go from there. He talked about on the value of selective ignorance as a writer and especially if you're someone who works in um, news. And I thought this was interesting. He said when he worked in writing for a newspaper, he said every day there was like Halloween. <laughs> and so now he tends to avoid newspapers because he was basically told, find the thing that's going to scare people the most and write about it. So for him, it was basically a place where... Um, Everything was about finding what would, what would terrify people. And so he winds up saying, I avoid newspapers at all costs. And I'm going to have to agree on that. Um, if I read the news all day, every day, I would probably be sad, angry, depressed, and all of those different things. So sometimes you have to be selective in what you're reading so that your mind can stay focused on things that are positive um and of course it goes back to that old saying for news if it bleeds it leads in other words if it's something horrible horrific tragic disgusting bloody murderous chances are that's what you're going to see on the news so when people tell me they spend a lot of time looking at the news i can tell i can tell by how they talk i can tell by how they speak I can tell by how many things they're afraid of <laughs> because their conversation is usually centered around what somebody's going to do to them, uh, how somebody could possibly harm them, how someone could possibly harm their family members. And that's when you have to say, you look at a lot of news, don't you? And then they're usually like, mm, yeah, I do. I watch CNN. I watch this. I watch that. And so you have to. Um, if you're going to stay in a, in a positive headspace, you also do have to um, think about how much news you are intaking, how much news you are intaking. Not that you don't look at the news. Um, I tend not to look at news. I look at short news clips, maybe through social media, but I tend to read articles more so than I look at news images because as a person who is a visual learner, I know that once I see it, it's going to go into my memory and it's going to be hard to get it out. So I would prefer to read news stories and that way I don't get a lot of the gruesome or the graphic images that then becomes implanted in my head and then I can't get them out. When I'm trying to think about something good or think about something positive, it becomes a hindrance to me. So that's what works for me. I, I tend to just read the articles as opposed to watching a lot of gruesome images. Some people, the images don't bother them. They can handle it. Um, and I say, hey, more power to you. If, if you can handle that, having those images in your mind and it doesn't affect you negatively, then, you know, that's your personal preference. But for a person like me, I'm very visual. I, I have a photographic memory. 
I can't be watching all of that stuff. So I don't do it. All right. Then he gives a couple of advices here. And he says, the world doesn't need your explanation on saying no. Now, remember, one of his books is the title of it is The Power of Saying No. And he said, the world doesn't need your explanation on saying no. He said, I don't give explanations anymore. And I'll catch myself when I start to give one because the world doesn't need all of my reasons why I'm saying no. I just need to say no and let no be a complete sentence. And I learned that myself the hard way. Um, I spent a year based on a challenge that God gave me. He gave me a 365 day challenge of saying no. <laughs> and uh, I stuck with it. Um, I had to tell a lot of people no in that particular year. And I learned a lot. I learned who was for me. I learned... Um, I learned the motive of people. That's what saying no for a year actually helped me to do. I learned that um, people are fine with you. Um, people will be your friend as long as you tell them yes to everything they want to do or everything they want you to partake of and be a part of. But the moment you start telling some people no, you're going to find out whether or not they're your friend or not or whether or not you were just a tool to be used in their life. So that's what the power of no actually helped me to figure out. It helped me to figure out who was okay with me having my own mind. Who was okay with me having my own opinion. Who was okay with me um, when they couldn't get out of me what they wanted to get out of me. Okay. So I totally agree with that. The world doesn't need your explanation on saying no. Just learn how to say no and let no be a complete sentence. All right. And lastly, he says, if you haven't found your overarching single purpose, maybe you don't have to. He said, the quest for a single purpose has ruined many people's lives. And that's powerful. Um, the way I feel about purpose is this. Live a life of purpose. Live a life of purpose and live on purpose Rather than trying to find a singular purpose, because this is what I have found out. Depending on your skills and depending on your personality and depending on um, your profession, right? You are going to mean different things to different people that you encounter in life. So I might have a, a overarching purpose, which is to be a blessing to anybody that I come into contact with. My overarching purpose is to teach people and to teach people free, to give people in information that will get them free in their thinking, in their mind, in their heart, in their experiences. So that's my overarching purpose. But depending on who I come into contact with in my life, I'm going to mean different things to different people. To some people, I was a teacher and they were my student. To other people, I was the editor that helped them to finally um, birth their book. So to them, I'm only an editor. That's all they see me as. To someone else, I was the person who helped them to stir up their creativity by listening to my music. So to them, I'm a musician and a singer that was able to break them through in an area of creativity that they didn't have before. So depending on... Who you come into contact with, your purpose is going to mean different things to different people. And that's okay. Just make sure that you're living on purpose. That whatever you're doing, you're doing it because you know that you are called to it. So I don't try to be everything to everybody. I try to be what that particular person needs me to be in that moment. Sometimes they need a teacher. Sometimes they need an editor. Sometimes they need a publisher. Sometimes they need a good song. So I don't get caught up and I don't get stuck into, um, like he said, this, I've got to find this single purpose. No, if you're living a life of purpose, if you are living to the glory of God, your purpose is going to 
um, be different things, again, to different people depending on who you come into contact with. For some people, I'm their pastor, and that's it. I'm not the, I'm not the person whose books they read. They don't listen to my music, and that's okay because for their life, that's what I need to be to them, okay? So I think sometimes we get caught up in that, but um, just understand, know who you are, know what you're called to do, and know what your purpose is.